things that you need to consider when you're discussing autonomy is how does your robot adapt to its environment? When you put this guy outside there, does he explore the world using a set of rules or does he explore the world through learning? Right. Now learning is a very important aspect of robotics. People are trying to create machines that are intelligent, much more intelligent than just sensors. Right? They are there are some competitions that, that are done in the both professional and amateur robotics industry. They do like a small maze, and your robot is supposed to move around solving it in the shortest time possible. Now, to achieve that, your robot needs to be able to remember things like which route did I use last? Was it a dead end? First of all, you all know what a maze is. Which route did I use last? Was it a dead end? Where was the next exit? Can I backtrack to that exit in case this is a dead end? So there's a whole lot of learning that it needs to do because it does not cram the maze. The maze is given to you on that day. So your robot needs to be able to adapt. Now a maze is a relatively controlled environment. If you put your robot on Kampala Road, right, it needs to be able to determine that there's someone in front of me. This is a car, this is a pothole. You know, it's a big issue here. This is a pothole, this is a wall, this is a bajaj, you know. There are all sorts of variables. And those variables cannot be programmed. You can program a means of saying, oh, if, if it's a bajaj, do this. If it's a pothole, do this. But how does it know it's a pothole? How does it know that? Because you might have said a pothole <coughs> is a hole of a certain size in the middle of the road. You know how Kampala's potholes just transform overnight. So one day you wake up and the road is in half. You know, how does it adapt to that? So those are some of the things that people are looking into. And then lastly, I want to discuss people like me and him, who would call, maybe he's a bit of a proper professional, but people would call amateur roboticists. These are people who have small labs in their home, they keep buying these chips, they learn a bit of electronics and try to figure out how to make things move, how to make things stand, blah, blah, blah. and it's a big industry. It's a big industry, and there are companies that are coming out to support us. Um, when, when I was in my S6 vacation, this was, I actually made my first robot in my S6 vacation. This was in 2000. Um, it, was, it didn't have any intelligence to it because I couldn't get these chips. Right? So without these chips, you are stuck on what you call analog control. Analog control means you're using mechanics to avoid obstacles, which is extremely difficult, right? So there are people who have noticed that there are a lot of people, even young kids, interested in amateur robotics. And they've started creating chips like this to help us. This chip is about $5, right? A few, about 20 years ago, to get a chip like this, you need to have some very serious connections, right? But now this is $5, the components in here. Unfortunately, it's an expensive hobby. Because if I'm to total up the money that I've spent on this, it'd probably be close to about $700, right? Because most of the stuff is not here. If it was here, because you spend about spend about 60% of that in shipping. Shipping, taxes, it's, it's crazy. But at the end of the day, it's about passion. Someone gave a very interesting poem about the things that separate you from your passion. And one of the things that separated me from my passion was the inability to get this and of course, even when you find it, you're too broke. So you know, you pass. Sorry, sorry. Yes. You made the first robot after senior? In my Essex vacation. Essex vacation, yeah. How many are going for vacation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you going to make a robot also or something? <laughs> it's very interesting because sometimes people think that uh, you have to wait at a certain point, yeah. and then you are able to make something. <laughs> <laughs> So the best time for you to do this kind of thing is at your age. That's when your mind is very innovative. So if you wait, say I need to go for an engineering course of me, first, you don't do it. If you have the passion to do it early, the better. Um, another way to sort of, an, ad, an, another principle that people are using, there's something called beam robotics, which is basically biology, environment, analog, and mechanics, still have to buy some of them. But it's essentially a much cheaper introduction to robotics. Unfortunately, it is extremely complicated on the other side of electronics, because you need to know the internal workings of these components. 
Um, and yeah, that's it. That's my presentation. Let me try and see if I can fix this. Reading a book. Um, what scientists are trying to predict, uh, or pre pre I can say predict, or what do they think science will be in, uh, in 50 years to come? And there were these amazing things different scientists had wrote about. Others were looking at uh, maybe one time to have an implant for the eye, those who have uh, had problems uh, with the eyes, or even those with normal eyesight, they can have maybe an implant which can detect infrared and you'll be able to see at night. So, <laughs> what do you see the future of the robots uh, in the next 50 years, possibly? And uh, that is in general, and in Uganda. <laughs> what do you see the, the, the future of robots? Primarily is dependent on the industry, right? Of course, the general idea for most robotics is, is to try and make this robot as independent and autonomous as possible, meaning that there is a core focus on intelligence. Right? People are trying to work towards making these machines more intelligent. However, in, like in the fields of medicine, people are working towards enhancing the human being. Right? I had a very interesting discussion about nanotechnology and nanorobots, about how they implant your body with millions of tiny organisms, and what they do is you fall sick and they treat you. Right? Because they are programmed with certain chemicals which they can release into your bloodstream to stimulate your body to create an, anti, an antibody, right? So those are, those are very scary scenarios, but it's the truth. And maybe he can add in terms of the future. Yeah, maybe what I that uh, we are not going to be running away from some of these things. They are coming and we have to adapt. <laughs> because if we don't adapt, we shall be left behind. The only way is uh, how do we adapt? We now need to focus what is good for us. Because as he clearly puts it, you see there are a lot of moral issues as far as uh, these things are concerned. We need, we need to pick what is good for us in order to change our society for the better. Now if you know that there's a robot which is going to be bombing, killing people, you don't need to go for that. Go for the ones which are going to help your society. And uh, just maybe to add, you see, based on the theme of what we are discussing here today, we are seeing this as a reality. He is not talking something abstract. He's talking about something he has done. And we can do it. Okay? You can do the same things. It's not, it's not coming from the moon. It's coming from here. Though there are challenges, but if you have the determination to succeed in making one, or to, to make robots to become part of our lives, to solve our own problems, then you can do it. That is the kind of person you have, and you see what is happening. So, you are right. In, in the next few, 50 years to come, machines are going to be controlling us. And we shall also, of course, at the end of the day, completely they may not have all that intelligence we have. I can say this is the challenge I had when I was actually making that robot you are seeing out there. I looked at the person who made us as being a super genius. Because I was just simply trying to manipulate a robot to be able to play a drum. You see, um, the kind of what he was talking about here. Now, when I looked at myself and coming up with a hand to play the drum very easily was a very big task. And I wanted this thing to happen when it is beating the drum, it also tries to shake its head like a human being. But to do that efficiently is not easy. So there's, there's that difference between us and the robots. They say they are, their efficiency, but the geniusness yeah. the human mind has is still super, supersedes that one of the robot. So they will be there for us. We shall control them, they will control us. So we shall control ourselves. The only thing is that we need to, we, we need we to bring them. them more. Yeah, we need to bring them into us. That's like what we want science to be within ourselves. Thank you. Okay, as I try to fix this, ask questions, and between the two of us, I think the three of us, we can answer some of the questions. Wow. <laughs> um, African culture says respect your elders. Yeah. <laughs> I want to respond to my brother's question about uh, the future of robots. 
in the next 50 years. Uh, I think, uh, to me, uh, in the next 50 years, we can uh, almost reach that state where most of the things will be done by robots. How can that be done? I will say the first one will be by changing the minds or the attitudes of the communities and more so the students. When we have a positive attitude towards science and technology and you have the, I would say the zeal, the ambition to get there, we shall have it. Uh, if we can benchmark with the world, you know, we are in a global world, and if every other country is driving towards that, why should we lag behind? So I would say if we can uh, change our attitude so that we become scientifically and technolog technologically literate, then we can have those kind of things. It is not difficult. If those others, like uh, I'll always refer to the countries that I've read about that have gone to, you'll find that some of these countries, by the time we got independence, we were even better than them in all ways. Like if you look at uh, the country, the eastern countries, like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and, and the rest, those countries will got independence almost at the same time. And they were much more educated than them. But the problem was our educators, our colonialists, they wanted helpers. So they didn't train us to think critically. So they trained us to help them in offices to do the work which they would have done themselves. But now those other countries, you know, they they, 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 they benchmarked with the other one, other, other countries of the world. So you'll find that everybody actually is technologically and scientifically literate. So if we can uh, uh, change our attitude and uh, uh, try to attain that kind of status, then we can make those kind of things. I see a bright future for that. That's what we're saying. So, I mean, as I have to be able to do it, for sustaining the world tomorrow. I can give you a brief story. I told my brother, right now in geography, I don't know how many of you have been in geography already. You are learning about uh, growing or, of rubber in Malaysia. But I want to tell you that there's no longer, there's, there's no rubber in Malaysia as of now. But you are still learning it in your geography. <laughs> what they're growing, what they're doing now is they're growing palm trees or palm oil, I would say. They're growing palm trees, which I think is being done in western Uganda. There's no palm, palm growing in western Uganda. But that brings them a lot of things. Out of the palm oil, they get the diesel for their vehicles to use. And yet they have oil like ours here, which is in the western Uganda. They have that kind of oil, but they have another oil from the palm, palm oil. And they don't end up there. They, cook, they transform it into cooking oil. They transform it into shop. They transform it into animal feed. And it ends up with no residue. So you can see that kind of technology. Robots do some of these things. So, Sometimes on the road, you don't see people. You will see cars moving, but you don't see people. In fact, you will tell you the one time because we found you were the only pedestrians on the road. Because everybody was, 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 was either in a shopping mall or in a factory or driving somewhere, but not walking on the road. So we can reach there, I'm very sure, in the next 50 years, if we can change our attitude and have this kind of debates 
I think we can uh, enlighten the others, you know. Right. I will give you two examples of chips that I've worked with. There is one called the PIC. The PIC is PIC. There are different versions, but basically they are all programmable. They are made by a company called Microchip. That's their name. So the one I've used is the PIC. 16F84A. PIC stands for Programmable Integrated Circuits. The PIC 16F84A. Now that one can... Okay, before we, before we go deeper, there are two things you need in order to program these chips. There's one called a programmer. This is a small board that looks like this. What this does is it converts your code into machine language. So you put your little chip in here, which is what I've been trying to do. You stick your little chip in here, and then you program it, and then you remove it and put it in whatever application you want. So the PIC programmer is a little bit expensive, right? And it works, it, it works with many languages, assembly, C, C++. Um, the one that I would recommend that is extremely good for starters is the one I'm using. It's called an Arduino. Arduino is A-R-D-U-I-N-O. It's one I recommend. This, this little board is $29. This cable is about $5, but you can find the cable in town. It's a special type of cable. It's called an A to B USB cable. This chip, you cannot, this board you cannot find in Uganda, so you need to order it. And then the chip itself is $5. Right. Now, the reason I recommend this is one, when you're, when you're getting started in this thing, you need support. You need people to give you advice and, you know, some help along the way. And me, the way I learn is through the internet. Right? So you go to Google, you type in Arduino programming, you get lots of stuff, and it will help you get started. The community is very vibrant. Secondly, it has an easy-to-use language programming language. When I say easy, easy is relative, but it's better than assembly, right? The language is some sort of mixture of C and Java, right? And then thirdly, it has a good number of what they call inputs and outputs. Inputs are basically things you use to interact with your digital world, whether you're collecting information from a solar, uh, a solar cell, whether you're outputting information to, to your TV, you know, it has a lot of functionality. So if you want to get started, this is a chip I would recommend. Of course, eventually you'll find, oh, I need this kind of sensor, then you have to buy that sensor. You need a certain board, you have to buy the board. Um, because this stuff is expensive, I bought this and figured out how to replicate it locally here, which is where you see this crazy stuff. This little piece at the back, this little piece is the equivalent of the that little controller. So instead of buying this and then plugging it into every single application I'm making, I just make this and I can unscrew it and screw it in and plug it into other things. So it makes development much easier. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, so we can have two people quickly, then they can interact with you later. Okay, I will ask the teacher to pick. Right here, and then, then a girl. A girl the boy, the boys you can ask me. One boy and uh, the front slider here. So perhaps you will be free to interact with him after. There are rumors that uh, they are actually robots that have a high class of intelligence to the extent that they are almost humans. But uh, I don't know if they are false, I just searched on the internet, that those who made such robots, due to ethical factors, mass hysteria and uh, Probably how those robots could cause world destruction. They were locked up somewhere in Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> That's what it says. I just want to know if that is actually true or just wrong. Okay, you need to consider two things. There are conspiracy theorists, and then there's the truth, right? Now, if without evidence, you can't tell. It points towards conspiracy theory, but 
the truth is a lot of the advanced technology we see now were available to military institutions probably five years ago. Right? So these people have huge research and development budgets, billions of dollars, and you will never see some of these things. There is, there is killing equipment out there that you cannot dream of. And because of its ethical reasons, they are not allowed to be released to the public. If the public knew, you know, guys would riot and make noise, but at the end of the day, there is research that's being done. So there will always be a rumor, but that rumor may be based on truth. Because I do know that they're relatively high, high relatively intelligent, intelligent robots. But because those are the ones we are allowed to see, it could mean that there are much more intelligent machines out there. Cyber knife, the surgical um, I'd like to know more about them. Do they like cut through the people? Do they? I don't really understand. Oh, is assume you have a crazy disease in Uganda and it needs a very highly specialized surgeon. And imagine that there's only one surgeon like that in the world, right? What research is doing is to try and create an, should I call it an instance of that surgeon, right? So you don't have to fly the surgeon into your country, but he can be where he is. He operates you remotely. So on your body, near your body, there's a robot that's cutting you. Yes, it cuts you. That's cutting you based on what this guy is doing the other side. Because he's the only professional. Right? So it cuts down on costs. Of course, the robot itself is an extremely expensive piece of equipment. But it cuts down on costs and can allow doctors to operate in remote areas where either it's not feasible for them to go or because of scheduling issues, they cannot keep flying around the world. And so I, I don't think any of them are auto automatic because you can't just release something like that in the human body. That is where the element of human control comes in. Okay, they, they, are, they have not yet stopped the other the boy and the girl again. Sorry, I mean, about his history. When, yeah, your history. When you're talking, when you're speaking about uh, where the period of time you began making the robot. You see, events like these ones, which are sporadic, they have to happen once in a while. You never know today we are meeting, tomorrow we are not together. How did you go on? Did you have somebody uh, driving you to, to the robot world? Or oh, it was by your own research that you came up with such? Thank you. Something that I believe infinitely is the curiosity of the human mind. I am one of those people who, is, who will ask questions and you will get tired of me, right? But most of the time, because there is no one who has answers to the questions you have, you look for the answers elsewhere. When I was a child, I used to, my father and I had problems, because I would take his equipment and take it apart, and he would complain, but you know, eventually, you know, parents love you, they support you, even if you're taking that TV apart. Anyway, so what happens is I began playing with this stuff a long time ago as a kid. And I would spend lots of time in the library, school library, learning basic electronics, how to switch on a lamp, how to control a motor. Then you actually get a chance, your father buys you a toy car and he expects you to play with it and you're scattering it in pieces. So that's how I learned some of these things. Reaching high school, of course, there's a bigger library, so, there's more information. So when a child is, uh, is uh, what? Remove the toy it depends on what they are doing. <laughs> if they grab it and throw it against the wall, <laughs> that's another story. But if they are curious, yeah. give them a chance to grow. So I went to secondary school, there was lots of opportunity because you know that books there are crazy. So it's there that I learned about airplanes. I tried to make my helicopter thing vibrated and never really took off. Um, I learned about hovercrafts. I made a hovercraft in S3. Very, very basic. Do you know what hovercraft is? Right? It travels over both land and water. It's basically, it basically has a huge fan at the bottom and it travels on a cushion of air. Right? So I learned that from an encyclopedia. Um, then in vacation, I got access to the internet, Google, search engines, online communities. I haven't had any official training in this stuff. Not electronics, not programming, not mechanics, except for high school. You know, the stuff you're learning now is what I had. So at the end of the day, it all boils down to how much are you willing to push yourself to learn what you don't know. That's the history. Uh, okay, people who are here, they have a question. Yes. Uh, I'm a 
I, I actually, I am hoping to start up an amateur robotics club in Uganda. But how to contact me, the best way would be through Cafe Sai. Because Betty has my number, she knows where to find me. Unfortunately, because it's so expensive, it needs funding. So hopefully I can interact with some of these World Bank people here and see if they can arrange some kind of funding. That's, that's the best answer I can give. Otherwise, I'm in my lab there and I... Who was it? Something like they say that these people, there are people who work on, who respond to commands of others, and they, and they don't use their original thoughts. That they can also become used as robots. Um. <laughs> what you call a metaphor, right? They are not saying that they are robots, but they're calling them robots because they act like robots, right? So it's not that they are robots. It's just that their behavior. You tell someone sweep, it bends down and sweeps. That's pretty much what a robot does. So that's why they call it. That's why they say. Okay, my question is about the chip still. Um, when these multifunctional robots, they use many chips with different specific functions, so you can put many programs.